Julius Hallerford was a predecessor of us, of me and my colleagues. He was a director at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Brain Research at the time in Berlin Buch. He was a very well-known, very famous scientist, physician scientist, but at the same time he became a scientist criminal, somebody who, in my view, contributed to murder and who did not stop from using the most atrocious crimes to help his research. During the Third Reich, first the people uh, who were uh, mentally ill, when they were first registered, they uh, were sterilized and later then, in the last step, they were killed by the so-called euthanasia program. When this happened, Hallerforden was again in charge to uh, look into the brains of these people. But, and now the but comes, in addition, he was extremely eager to get all possible brains into his institute to investigate them and in this kind of uh, manic collection uh, disease that he had, he went by far too much, meaning that at the end he got an enormous amount of brains. The estimate is more than a thousand brains. And these are the, the cases that form the basis of the, the, the issue that we're talk, talking about today, because the um, histological remains from these cases ended up um, little by little um, finding their way to what became our institute in Frankfurt. Um, from, from what we can understand in reading all of the texts, it looks as if he had access to the patients, so he was frequently visiting the patients there. And he um, would identify patients that looked interesting to him and then by some means um, order their uh, execution and then um, have the brain sectioned and, and look at the brains of these um, children. The question arises whether not only he was a passive type of person to get the brains in, but he was also an active person that he tried to select certain diseases and get the brains of people with certain diseases into his collection. This is still an open uh, debate. However, it is also it has been proven that he was active in Brandenburg Garden and he uh, took out the brains of uh, children that were killed within the same day. Yeah? So he, he knew what was going on. So he clearly knew that these were people who were killed. I mean, one, one case that was highlighted by Ali is, is uh, three brothers. Um, Kutschke is their name, or was their name. So, so they died sort of at successively younger stages. They all suffered from the same of neurodegenerative disease um, and that's sort of you know I mean, that's the way you would design a scientific experiment that you sort of take specimen at, at different time points. I, I, I think you know in the case of eugenics for example the problem is that it was it was the scientists in, 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 in great part, and in particular the medical profession at the time in Germany and elsewhere. Eugenics was not a purely uh, German phenomenon. It was actually extremely active in the US, in the UK, in many places in the world. Um, was was designed by scientists, right? It's, they pushed their agenda. They exploited uh, the sympathies and uh, the resonance they could get from the political regime in all its madness, um, to do what they wanted to do. It was a modern uh, movement to um, put social policy on a rational basis, but also the scientists were to be in a position of power. 
really, to decide on issues of reproduction, who would be, who would be fit to reproduce, to decide on issues of family welfare, the cost of the sickness insurance system, the cost of psychiatric care were declared to be a burden on the fit and healthy and arguments began to be made um, for the killing of what was called life unworthy of life. When the Nazis took over in 1933 there was a reconfiguration of these sciences. Um, this provided new opportunities for a new generation of researchers like um, Julius Hallervorden and uh, Hugo Spatz who came together in the reconstituted Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Brain Research. And an interesting part is uh, the medical doctors had the highest proportion of any profession of members of the Nazi party. Yeah? So they were particularly infiltrated by the Nazi ideology. And a lot of those doctors who served in the uh, psychiatry hospitals uh, killing the patients, they were extremely young doctors and they made their careers by that. So there was a kind of uh, infiltration of the whole medical uh, profession by the Nazi ideology. I think one thing that brain anatomists as general anatomists want is material which has died, which is fresh, uh, so, so that the conservation process can be done as quickly as possible. Um, and when Julius Hallervorden um, heard about euthanasia, uh, he saw this as a great opportunity for his research. Now we also know it, it went beyond just taking tissue from patients that had been murdered. The scientists also actively asked for uh, specimens from patients, um, calling up those clinics, asking whether it would be possible to also have maybe the brain of the sibling for control. And so I guess there is proof of evidence that there was uh, intentional killing in order to obtain material for scientific purposes as horrible as it sounds. So the gassing of the uh, patients that was stopped. However, from 41 to 45, the so-called wild euthanasia, wild meaning just have the individuals from starvation by injections and other uh, means killed. So this wild euthanasia continued throughout uh, the war. So at the end, Probably in the first part, 120,000 people were killed in the first uh, stage of the euthanasia and until the end of the war probably up to 300,000. I mean, I think it's important, it is right, it's important to look at things in this context, although it, for us, you know, today it's it, almost impossible to imagine the mindset that they would have. And it's true that if you look at what Halliburton said in his defense, and actually he wasn't even defensive about it, it wasn't as if he was, he, he felt as if he had bad intentions. It seemed to him scientifically legitimate to do this. But of course, you know, now it seems absolutely horrific. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think you could say, okay, given the context, we or we need to interpret it in the context, but for me, I feel like some things are so horrible that the context doesn't matter. This is actually a context that I often hear now that we're discussing these histories or this history again extensively. The notion of um, explanatory, if not um, permissive or, yeah, exculpatory even context so and I'm very much appalled by that because yes there was eugenics movement and sterilization for instance of uh, diseased or disabled patients was something that did also happen and as bad as that is that may be context contextually explained but murdering patients at no time also then was legal. 
and at no time was morally excusable. So this is really the breach. This is the, the difference between something that's maybe a, a whatever general societal movement and murder. So this is a crime, and this was a crime back then. It had been a crime for decades back then. It's not that these were just moving moral or moving moral standards. No, this was a crime back then, had been a crime for a long time, and uh, by no means was it excusable uh, by the circumstances. So I think this has to be very strongly stated. When, when I was um, reading the, the literature that was, has been put together about the 100 years of science at the Institute, um, I was particularly shocked to, to see the crimes that were committed in, in, names of, in the name of science, but I didn't find any legal ramifications for the people who committed the science, uh, these crimes. They were, the, the crimes were very well documented. It was clear, but looking back after the 1945 period, there wasn't um, anybody who w went to jail or paid fines or, or lost their positions. And this was something that I found particularly troubling for me to see that this was the way um, the society at large was dealing with these issues. I think if you look sort of historically, there were multiple periods of time or opportunities where you know, the right thing could have been done, and it wasn't. In 1945, Leo Alexander, an American neurologist who was trained here in Frankfurt by Karl Kleist, he came and he interviewed Hallervorden because the uh, Americans and British, they knew that the Nazi regime had done extremely uh, criminal acts to people with medical experiments. Leo Alexander visits Hallervorden. Hallervorden admits freely that he um, used around 600 brains of euthanasia patients, but he denies any active involvement in, on the wards and any active role in selecting who was to be killed. So Hallervorden then probably realized for the first time maybe that what he did was morally just not correct. And I think he started then to cleanse his collections. What was left over then was a cleanse collection. However, he still continued to work with the brain sections until 1960. So 15 years after the war, he still was working with the brain sections and he did not have the feeling probably that he did something wrong. And I suppose he never had this feeling. So um, the, 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 the outrage for me is, is not only what he did, but the fact that uh, nothing changed afterwards and he continued to build a career with material required during this, uh, this period. He is on the margins of the Nuremberg Doctors' Trial, um, but on the one hand. On the other hand, he has a seamless career. Um, I know that the International um, Societies for Neuropathology knew about it and had avoided him for quite some time. But I also know that um, quite late in his career he was re-invited to give presentations, so the community of neuropathologists re-accepted him, uh, even though it was known what he had done. Uh, and who wanted to know could know, because there were books around. Uh, and after the Auschwitz uh, trial in Frankfurt, everybody was aware of it, of all the details. So there's no excuse of not knowing. So. I think the only way to consider this or analyze this or understand this is as a global attempt at or a national attempt at dealing with a, a massive um, disturbance, a total breach in standards uh, as uh, is, is it's being called, um, really a rupture in civilization and I think only in this context and the magnitude of this context can be understood how then people try to live with it uh, in one way or the other and a major um, solution seems to have been uh, silence. We have the saying of the, the generation of the silent fathers 
I'm a fortunate exception. My father told me from the very beginning what he knew, and people knew much more than um, was admitted later. And this is what you see in, in all um, situations where a totalitarian system collapses and is replaced. Uh, those who have been involved, they reappear disguised uh, under different names and they reoccupy important positions in the society and then they protect each other. But you should be aware, uh, after the war of course, the police had to continue, the state employees had to continue, the foreign office had also old Nazis in, even Adenauer's head of the chancery was a former Nazi. And the same holds for the Kaiser Wilhelm Max Planck Society. The general director was before the war or during the war and after the war the same. And the president of the Max Planck Society the, after uh, Max Planck, Otto Hahn, was Adolf Butenand. And Adolf Butenand was clearly already before the war involved with the uh, Third Reich regime. So, and therefore you could not expect that there was a complete break yeah, and a complete restoration of the moral principles immediately after the war. It just evolved gradually and in 1968, the student revolution, it really gave it a kick uh, in the right direction. In 1968, people really had a, um, uh, enough distance from this to really demand that the, the remaining people who were active in the Nazi time step down. Um, and I think it takes apparently a long time until a society is able to, to deal with something like this in a, in a, in a slightly better way. So, uh, when Hallerford retired, his former uh, co-worker, Wilhelm Krücke, who was serving since 1936 in the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute and who was at that time professor of neuropathology at the University of Frankfurt. Wilhelm Krücke succeeded Hallerforden as the director of the neuropathology department of the now Max Planck Institute for Brain Research. And they were then uh, running the institute until the late 70s when they retired. And in 1981, Wolf Singer and myself, we became the young directors of the Institute. I met uh, Krücke and uh, he had moved out of the office, which I took over a day before. Yeah, so there was a complete <laughs> switch within one day. However, what was not switched was all the corridors were filled with cabinets. And in these cabinets, there were small small drawers and those drawers were filled with ten thousands of brain sections yeah so i asked krücke what is what do we, what, what should we do with all these sections he knew exactly because he took out some of the brains in berlin buch himself so he knew exactly what it was i asked him what do we do with these sections he said oh you just can forget about them these are mainly brain sections of stroke patients, which we had in Frankfurt collected during the years for medical reasons and, and so on. Uh, just you can throw them, just or bury them, yeah? Just get rid of them. For me, those were pathological slides, and I knew that they exist in all pathological institutes in huge amounts, and so here as well. So I, had, I didn't make the connection, um, even though I could have. Um, had I had a, a trigger, even though I didn't know, I, I knew we had all sorts of slides from Berlin Buch, I, I could have, probably if I had been attentive, um, I could have done what Ali did, become suspicious, saying, ah, I know what happened in Berlin Buch, I know, I read the Alexander Report, I know who Hallerforden was, he was involved, do we have slides of Hallerforden? So, I think we could have pushed this inquiry had we, had we felt, at least I didn't, responsible for this collection. So in 1986 then, Götz Ali, who knew a lot about the history, who was aware what was going on in brandenburg -Gerden, yeah, which was the place where Hallerforden uh, was uh, the, the prosector, 
So he came to the institute and then looked through the sections and he clearly, from the, uh, from the date when 30 children were uh, killed, he could really infer that these were victims of the euthanasia pro program because they all died on the same day. So I got in contact with Götz. He, he told me about his suspicions. And um, I remember that without having asked anybody, I invited him to come and see what he sees, what he finds. Uh, I opened all cupboards where, where the dossiers were. And so he, he took photocopies. I remember we were sitting many hours here also in the evening. I didn't let him alone, which I couldn't. Um, because he was not a guest of the Institute or so, but we, we, I was here when he was here and he had free access to all the dossier and all the photocopy facilities. So he copied a huge amount of paper and then evaluated it by cross-correlating what he had seen in our, in our papers with the documents he had found in the clinics that performed euthanasia. And by this cross-correlation analysis, he found that, yes, specimens that had been in our files um, corresponded to protocols he had found in those clinics. And that, of course, was a very, very important step to have this as written, documented and uh, non-revocable proof, because Again, ex excuses had been found all the time, including saying one cannot research these sections for medical confidentiality reasons. Or, um, Ali, you're not a medical doctor, you cannot access these sections. And all these totally absurd arguments, which I can only see as an attempt, a global attempt, common attempt to hinder and hamper uh, revelations. And uh, in that sense, Ali's investigations were absolutely groundbreaking, at least for our institute and the society, the Max Planck Society. And I think I'm just grateful uh, to Götz Ali that he uh, did not stop and did not get deterred by uh, all the forces working against him. Even though I, I think he, his um, MO and, and, and um, the style of his um, um, investigation and so on could be criticized as not being totally objective uh, when when you realize that that was met with so much resistance and and uh, uh, refusal to to help um, yeah at some degree you sort of understand the, the anger I remember vividly meeting Gertz in 1985 when he was rightfully in highly indignant and steamed up about these issues. Uh, for him it was a question of accusing the perpetrators and attacking the German establishment which for him showed direct continuities of the old Nazi establishment. We know that it was discussed between the institutes and the, um, the general direction of the uh, Max Planck Society, who were not at all happy with these forms of accusations being launched against them. A big concern was how, was how the American scientific community would respond and whether critical studies being published in the US might mean that German science might be excluded from publishing in American scientific journals, might be excluded from participation in conferences. After all, Julius Hallerford and himself had difficulties at certain international conferences. I think sometimes they wish people, oh gosh, I just wish those this is like hadn't been you know, on my watch. This is something that should have happened 30, 40, 50 years ago and it's happened now. Uh, what do we do? Uh, maybe we'll do nothing or maybe... And it could all go away. <laughs> and of course it doesn't go away. Now, uh, what I didn't know is that the Max Planck Society was uh, having problems with Getz Ali. Yeah. So he cites in his book two uh, letters of mine 
uh, in one letter, uh, I was asked by the headquarter whether they should make a lawsuit against Ali uh, and so on. And I told them, no, don't do it because uh, it will only uh, give more and more uh, publicity to the whole fact. And I must say at that time, we were heavily under pressure from the anti sectionists, so the people who are against animal experiments. So we had pressure from all sides and I just wanted to keep uh, the things a little bit down because otherwise <coughs> there was the anti sectionists, they invaded the institute, they uh, made a fire in the institute. So it was a real difficult time. So I said, no, no lawsuit. In retrospect, I would have said no lawsuit yeah, because Ali is absolutely correct. Yeah? But at that time, my reasoning was a different one. And I must say, this was a misjudgment on my side. And then Götz Ali wrote a report to the president. And then we young uh, directors, we had to, to, to know what, what do we do with that? How do we handle the problem? So the first one was that we decided nobody can work with this material anymore. So it was locked away. At that time, uh, it became also clear that specimens had been found somewhere else. So the whole issue became a, a federal issue. And this then caused a lot of uh, public uh, concern, not concern, but stronger, a public uh, revolution against this. Yeah? And so finally then uh, it was decided very high up in the Federal Republic of Germany by Herr Kohl, by a letter of the Chancellor, that uh, this uh, specimen should be buried and uh, have a ceremony with uh, uh, priests of Protestant, Jewish uh, rabbi and a Catholic priest. And so the sections were then uh, uh, buried and there is a, a stone erected, a memory stone, where it's written that scientists and so on should really uh, keep very high moral standards and should also uh, consider what they are doing and not doing harm to the people. And I participated in both these ceremonies and I must say, uh, I was strongly affected uh, by what was going on there and by the amount of, of, of uh, injustice that was uh, done to these poor people. For me it was clear it needed to be handled in the framework of a um, dignifying ceremony. And uh, I didn't see it as a second final solution, no. Uh, these, these were specimens of people who had already died. Um, I, I, I frankly don't see another way to, to handle this. Uh, we could have kept them in our metal boxes over here in the cellar. No solution either. Um, exposed them somewhere. No solution at all. I remember that journalists, after it became known, came here wanted to film those specimens and I, I refused. I said, no, this is, we, we, we had locked them up for several reasons. One was just to be sure that they are now no longer accessible to anybody, sort of sacred. Uh, also to prevent further scientific inquiries on these specimens and also to prevent uh, this, the public to, to to take it as a material, as a basis of sensation making. And this is sensation seeking, and this is what the, the media wanted at that time. It's still a discussion going on. When you, uh, when you read the paper of uh, Professor Weindling from Oxford, so he wrote a paper, Cleansing Neuroanatomical Specimen from German Collections. And there he discusses very openly what was going on between 1985 and 1990. And he also mentions Schlote's position. And so I can understand both positions. On the other hand, I know that uh, if you go to a mu museum or, or to a memorial place and then you see all these sections which are part of human bodies, this is not uh, the correct way of exhibit those things. So I think they should be really uh, buried like uh, parts of human bodies. I mean, the burial is, a, I can say, uh, 
is a panicked response with only retrospective notification of the public, but never with an um, saying to families, you know, we have here the burial of a, of, of a family member of yours, of their brains, um, would you like to attend? Or do you want to bury the specimen elsewhere? Or what would you like done? Um, I remember the, the sense of panic and concern at the time and I remember one person saying with enormous relief, we've done it. Thought, what have we done? So he said, we've done it, we've buried them all. Oh, have you? Yes, we buried them last week. Oh, and I remember thinking, um, did you invite anyone? Did you, you know, was there a child? Oh, that would have been interesting. I, you know, that's something that uh, maybe that many people should have, would have wished to attend that ceremony. Part of the process of euthanasia was the dehumanization, the depersonalization, um, that at most a person was, if not a, a burden, a costly burden on the fit and healthy German race, but um, a specimen restoring their identity, restoring their life history would have a symbolic in significance and it would also have significance to the wider public because if brothers and sisters and parents and nephews, nieces, great nephews, nieces or whatever were still alive um, they would wish to know because after all that person was just written out of their family in some way and there was a sense of loss and con sense of concern very often but you don't know what happened to them and I think this proper closure is very different to the uh, closure that was attempted to be achieved by an institution for its scientific purposes but from a, a victim's point of view and from the victim's family's point of view is not a form of closure at all. It's, it's a form of concealment in the end. Each of these sections belonged to one person, human being, with a history, with a life, with a name to start with. And there must be also the attempt of documentation, of personalization. We have to try to find a way of dealing with this past that is appropriate for the magnitude of the crimes and that has to involve a personal identification. Uh, it would be a very powerful uh, form of taking responsibility and taking that responsibility um, is one which I think pro required more thought and is also an ongoing, it should be done as an ongoing responsibility because it's naive to think that you will locate everything if you're doing it in a rush. To me, the thing that uh, has not been done and should be done is, is to bring back the humanity to uh, the issue, meaning that we're talking about material, about brain, about slides, about brain slices and so on, and there are no people behind this. Well, there are people. And so I think that what we would like to do is, for all cases for which we have names and identification and so on, to put back those lives on what happened. And I think that's the next thing for us to do, both for those um, identified uh, people and kids who are killed um, and whose um, biological material, for lack of a better word, uh, were buried in, in the 90s and then for whatever new materials might uh, turn up, um, sadly, in the future, which might happen. I have to say I was surprised uh, with myself how um, over the past month, since January, ex uh, essentially, when this uh, um, history came up again, how my view also again has substantially changed. And I have to say my growing 
view is that this is not even close to dealt with. To the contrary, it's, it's not dealt with and there are some things still popping up. No, my growing impression and opinion is that the magnitude of these atrocities and uh, the unexplicable, well, that's actually a difficult term, the, the just terrifying magnitude of the crimes committed and the magnitude of all of this, this will haunt us for long and should haunt us for long. I think it's something that younger people should be aware of. We are all carrying the burden of, of this very, very dark times in the history. Even so, we are not personally those that were directly involved in those crimes. Still, I think we collectively have the responsibility to address them right now in, in the most transparent way possible. Not to hide it, not to say it's none of our business because it was done by other people, but just to say this is the history as it is and let's have a look and deal with the best we can. We have to be completely open about what has happened. Um, as I said earlier, it's, it cannot be undone. And um, the only thing we can do now is um, to use this sad history um, in a positive manner. Be open about it, use it, learn from it, um, use it to teach next generations, use it to remember those people and sort of establish a basic um, um, behavior of commemoration and memory um, because they deserve it. Also, I think a, a very good suggestion that came up is um, to have sort of half a day, a year of, of sort of a dedicated remembrance, especially then for the new people to really make this part of their part of their um, picture of, of, of Germany, part of their picture of science and to reinforce the idea that, I mean, of course, as a scientist, like in any other um, profession, you do have, um, you know, a huge responsibility. One of our plans is to have uh, every year an event related to ethics ethics in general and ethics in science, uh, talk by an ethicist or philosopher and sort of force all of us to uh, think about this and use it as a, uh, an education for us. It's, it seems pretty clear that, that in order to, you know, not make a mistake again, that you need to share the information and you need everybody to understand. You have to keep this, this idea alive. I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to do here so that it, it's not forgotten. I think you should have a continuous type of either exhibition or a movie like that. But even more important, I think, it should show us, the young scientists, I'm no longer young, but the young scientists of the Institute, it should show them how you can really cross moral borders by your own research. This should stimulate us that we are much more critical asking ourselves. So is that what we are doing? Is this really justified on ethical grounds? Absolutely. This past is part of my scientific work because this is what my predecessors did. These were things that give the context for what we can do right now. And these ethical considerations have to be there and have to be present and uh, can't be suppressed and shouldn't be um, externalized. We have to be very, very careful with uh, how we work as scientists. We have to reflect the, bounds, the boundaries of what we uh, can do and should do. This uh, implies, of course, questions about where do we get biological samples from, be it animals or human samples from operations or so. It also applies to questions of uh, what experiments can we do, even if it doesn't involve the question of where specimens come from, but you know, what kinds of possibilities do we want to create in the um, context of genetic modifications, for instance. Here my very strong experience, which I, I am, have a hard time to explain, is that as time goes on, these atrocities hit me more and more. 
I have been to a recent conference in Paris on the brain that pulls the trigger. The question, and I think this is, this is a question that needs scientific inquiry, how can it be that in a single brain you have so different behavioral dispositions? You have <coughs> the family father, take, take an SS guy in Auschwitz. All those people, they have a virtually normal biography. Um, they have usually families to which they return when they are on vacations, or in the case of Auschwitz, they have been even living with their families there because they were there for years. They have children, they bring them to bed, and in the morning they go on, they go on the ramp and, and sort out children, uh, children of other mothers. And how can that coexist? And there is no, there is no explanation so far except the statement, it is possible. And this is, I think, a very, very worrying observation that um, probably each of us, if brainwashed enough, if motivated enough, or if humiliated enough, or if uh, suffering from too weak an identity that needs a group in order to be consolidated, is capable of doing these things. And this is what I, that worries me most as a present problem. And, and you have it happening all over the world every day. And, and so, is there a way to educate our children so that they become resilient against such behavioral dispositions? If you have a recipe, tell me. It was a majority opinion, somehow it developed. Um, and looking back, it looks like a as if there were aliens governing this country, but these were not aliens, these were people who were still part of the society that were remained in the society for years on, until 70 years later, probably their, um, their descendants, be it genetic or, or scientific descendants, are still among us. Yeah, it's a sort of, a, it's extremely troubling, but interesting, but it's sort of a collective madness where you participate in in, 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 uh, in a global framework that justifies any kind of action you decide is right or you would want to do. It's, and yeah, um, it's humans who do this. We are humans. We can all do this. This is what's scary. This is why we have to learn. Even the language is difficult. How do you talk about that time without making the obvious excuses in your language, as we discussed, saying the Nazis or um, Germany was captivated by a Nazi regime or Nazi doctors. Hallervorden was not a Nazi doctor, by all we know. I mean, maybe he was kind of sympathetic with the Nazis, but no, he, again, he was a major scientist who then committed murderous crimes. Of course, there must be something wrong in these brains at that very same moment in order to be able to do that. Um, and you can also extend this problem to the judgment of criminals in general. Of course something in their brains must be other than it is in yours and mine in that very moment because we wouldn't simply not do it. Which is no excuse. I mean there is no excuse for this. There is no excuse and there will never be any excuse even if we fully understand. Now there is also no excuse for other reasons. There were people at the same time living who did not do it, who even put their life in danger, in refusing, and as we now know, there were many, many occasions to refuse that had not been taken advantage of. Okay, I often ask myself, how would I have acted in the situation of Hallervorden? In the Third Reich, uh, being interested, as I explained, so from his childhood, yeah, he was in a lunatic uh, asylum and his father was a doctor there. And so all his life, he was trying to find the material basis of mental diseases. How would I have acted if suddenly I would have access to hundreds of brains of people where the register of their disease was known and so on, and now I would have the chance 
yeah, to look into the brains and find out what has happened. I asked myself, how would I have reacted? And I can tell you, I cannot answer it. And we should not forget that if we judge Hallerforden from now, uh, we impose on the history the knowledge of our days and the moral categories of our days. So I do not want to, to put myself on a, a moral status which is uh, saying I never would have done it. I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's very difficult to even say those words because it's difficult to um, put yourself in the, in the, the place of, uh, of people who were doing these things and uh, understanding what uh, sort of moral justification they managed to conjure up for themselves. I cannot, and maybe this is a sort of maternal thing, but I cannot imagine this, this crime or feeling it was okay to do this. It makes me sick to my stomach. I mean, I just, I cannot create an excuse for him. The part of me that says, oh, let's put it in context, is, you know, this very high-minded, intellectual sort of thing that, oh, we should withdraw ourselves from the emotions of the situation. But as a human, I am sick about it, just sick. Hallerforden was one of the leading neuroscientists of his time, a famous, world-famous scientist in a society that prided itself of being the best scientific and also industrialized and uh, artistically um, accomplished society uh, of the time. A director of an institute like this, of our predecessor institute, famous, you know, in, within the society, high standing, all of that. And that person, not some crazy person, that person committed these crimes. And this is, I think, what we should not try to diminish in its terror that this uh, describes. I know not, I don't know enough about Hallerforden's uh, biography or psychology in order to be able to give him a diagnosis. I don't think he will have one. I think he will, he will turn out to be a scientist, probably even a gifted scientist, um, who just was able to do all this. What I'm definitely very, very skeptical of is the attempt to label those criminals that we know about now as, again, you know, deviated somehow, you know, it was some deviation, the difficult psychology or difficult past or what does that mean? I mean, th this is so simplistic in, a, in an attempt to maybe again find simple explanations that allow us to distance ourselves and say um, that was his problem and you know, none of us, of course, has this condition, so no problem. I find that not convincing and I'm worried it's, it's a much bigger problem. And I'm worried there is very little we can in general or even in particular attribute to these people that makes it easier to deal with what they did. I think these were humans, Germans, scientists, that's what they were and they did what they did. <laughs>